Okay. Okay. Well, basically, let me see if I can if I'm good. Enough, get a spreadsheet up here. Not. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Here we go. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. Uh, basically, I just want to kind of go through this. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, in in uh, all the information that's provided here. I'm trying to move some things here. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of start at the top. What I've got is I've, I basically have divided all the different treatment options up by the uh, recommender, if you will. And, uh, and then I've also just highlighted a few of them that I'll say kind of floated based on my research, et cetera, kind of floated to the top. And uh, so kind of let me start to take you through them. And I think you'll see that some of my decision making builds on what I found out about some other treatments, such as you know, at, the, at the top here, we have the, the drug, I think it's called Ever, Everolimus, or that's how I'm pronouncing it, if you will that was recommended based upon my foundation's medicine uh, somatic testing uh, biopsy. And uh, the thing that uh, you'll, you'll really see here that kind of underlines- uh, Mike, Mike, could I just, just jump in to say, could you just take two steps back and introduce yourself yeah. and your medical history before we jump into the treatment <laughs> options you're considering? Okay, good, good, good idea. Thanks, Brad. Uh, basically, I'm Mike Yancey, and uh, basically, I was diagnosed in uh, July of 2021 with uh, de novo metastatic uh, prostate cancer, and uh, was immediately put on, at that point in time, I didn't know anything. I've learned a lot since then, but I uh, was immediately put on uh, Lupron, as well as uh, docetaxel chemo, uh, finished up my docetaxel November 29th of last year, and and uh, basically, we did the some blood tests at that point in time, and my PSA was at its lowest at 0 0.07 at that time. Uh, however, by March, it had already started to increase slowly, and uh, that concerned me. And I actually voiced my concern to a couple of oncologists, and they said, don't worry about it. It's so small and it's still way under one. And uh, that's when I ended up uh, getting with a new oncologist down in Houston, and uh, she basically uh, some further test, if you will, and also determined that my particular cancer is very aggressive. Uh, I've got three primary mutations, which is a lot of what has been focused on here with these uh, treatment recommendations. I've got P10 loss, uh, and then I've got uh, mutations in the RB1 and the uh, TP53 uh, genes, if you will, or whatever. And those are all those three together are known as tumor suppressor genes, and are also uh, if you have have any two out of three, uh, that's considered aggressive variant. Of course, I've got three out of three. Lucky me. And uh, so anyway, uh, having finished docetaxel, I was put on abiraterone in in April, and uh, really haven't seen a lot of impact from that, even though I'm still taking it. And then, of course, the primary thing that uh, up to this point in time that, that we're doing is I started Plavicto, uh, which, of course, is a, is a radio isotope uh, radiation, if you will. Uh, started that in August, August 8th, I think it was. And I just finished my second treatment last Thursday. And so far, from the perspective of any pain, et cetera, it has eliminated almost all of that. And... Uh, uh, with respect to my PSA, it once again creeped up a, a little bit more since I had my uh, test done in, in July. And uh, so we're going to have scan done October 20th, and we'll get a better picture, PSMA scans, if you will. And so hopefully we'll get a better picture as to uh, what impact the uh, Plavicto is actually having on the cancer from the uh, original scans that were done back in July. So Any if I could just, yeah, if I could just summarize back, if I remember, the highlights are... You, when you were diagnosed, you were, you were immediately metastatic. And so you skipped prostatectomy. Correct. Uh, which is what is many other prostate case, cancer patients is step one. And the other thing is that you metastasized into your bones. And so you had bone mats and uh, you had a lot of bone pain. And part, so, so one of the effects was you, you really had difficulty walking, right? Mobility issues. Correct. And so the, the Pluvicto is the first therapy you've taken 
I guess I'm just sort of wanted to kind of get a sense of how you felt through the different treatment regimens you've had. So how many lines of therapy have you had Four. Well, basically, I mean, I've had, of course, the, uh, the Lupron, you know, ADT, if you will, had the Lupron. And then, of course, I immediately had chemotherapy at the same time. And I also had uh, pelvic radiation initially, purpose of not really focused on the cancer itself as much to relieve the pain issues I had. And uh, so I had that. Then I started, I had the, radi or excuse me, the chemotherapy almost simultaneously. And that really did knock down the cancer and, and help a lot uh, while I was taking taking the chemotherapy, which ended, like I said, November 29th, and uh, was doing pretty good, started to at least uh, to, to rebuild my strength, et cetera, and then we found in March that things, the PSA was been beginning to creep up, even though it was still, you know, sub one, and uh, that's when I you know, got with a new oncologist, she did the oncologist, and was able to determine that my cancer and, and and a characteristic of, of aggressive variant oftentimes is that, it, that, that that cancer does not put out much PSA, which gets back to a lot of the reasoning why we were never able to catch it. Or even though I had an annual physical in an October before diagnosed in July, my PSA was only 2.4. Oh. So, uh, and the, just trying to, again, so how is your, your bone pain been relative to those treatments? Did the, when, it, you know, when your cancer was knocked down by the chemo, did it also uh, re reduce your bone pain? Yes, the combination of that and the radiation uh, eliminated pretty much my bone pain for a period of months, if you will. I did start to get uh, quite a bit more bone pain beginning in May. In fact, I had bone pain while I saw my new oncologist in Houston. It was in my shoulders at that point. And that's when we did the PSMA scan was confirmed. Indeed, it had spread beyond my pelvis, my femur and my spine to my shoulders. And uh, that's when we decided on Flavicto and because of the Flavicto uh, issues with respect to uh, production, et cetera, it, it was delayed, I'll say a month because we originally were looking at July, it was delayed till August. And uh, my bone, bone pain got so bad that I ended up taking some uh, Statin, not no, not statins. Uh, mm -hmm. Steroids that helped to uh, uh, push the bone pain back while I was on a trip. And as soon as I got back from my trips, when I started Plavicto, and so far with Plavicto, it has eliminated all pain. I've started my uh, four miles every morning walking with no problems whatsoever, and so we're under the assumption that it is doing what it was intended to do, which is knocking back the cancer, and we will confirm that with the scans on October twentieth. And for those who don't know about Pluvicto, it targets the PSMA, the same PSMA that you get in the PET scan that finds out where the, the cancer is metastasized. So it's, it's uh, the fact that you uh, had a PSMA PET scan and it said you lit up in all these places, that makes you a good candidate for Pluvicto because you know you're, you're presenting a lot of uh, PSMA. Um, how did you arrive at the selection of the flu victim? Was that something you picked up from this group or had you gotten it from another source? And when you recommended it to your uh, physician, was there any uh, like immediate uh, uh, reaction? Well, basically with, uh, with my college down in Houston, <clears throat> once she confirmed that uh, everything that I'm an aggressive variant, I'd already had chemo uh, other than, and the fact that I'd already started apparatus around about a month and a half or before I met her, uh, she, she decided that Plavicto was the next best option because this particular cancer does not, it's known not to respond to the variety of drugs there. So therefore, you know, things like abiraterone, that I don't seem to be responding to that. Uh, the chemotherapy, in most cases, I think you could say that uh, when people with the normal version, because my particular version, about 1% of the people have that. So with the normal version, what I call the normal version, a lot of times you can take the chemo, the docetaxel, and it'll knock it, knock the cancer back for maybe up to two years, where in my case, the best I got was four months. And uh, so at this point, in all honesty, uh, with respect to standard of care, after I finished Plavicto, and the fact that Plavicto is currently not approved to uh, do it a second time, the only option we've currently got on the plate will be uh, capitaxel with carboplatin. 
And uh, once we do that, once once again, it'll take about four months to get through the treatment cycle with that. And then assuming that it works very much like those actual does, uh, you have about four months after that, and then we're out of options. So that's why these treatments that we're going to look at today uh, are of interest. It's, it's interesting that uh, one of the things that Michael Liebman pointed out was uh, it's important to get sort of a segmentation of the kind of cancer you have at the outset, which can often come from pathology. But it seems like you've almost got like, you know, how, you know how women have triple negative breast cancer. It's almost like you've got triple negative or triple positive on these three markers. And those came through gene sequencing. Correct. And, Correct. and so once you're, once you're in that category now, you, you've really got some, it's from what, it, from the conversation we're having, it sounds like that really steers you to some treatments that are likely to work and those that aren't, but it's very important to have that, that first level, that filter that you have, which is those, those three markers that are, are critical for kind of indicating what will and what work among treatments. Yeah. Correct. Um, Mike, you know, you have, um, a pretty aggressive um, cancer, as we just mentioned. RB1 is particularly uh, tough, and it is known to be resistant to abiraterone. Why did the doctors actually decide to, to give you abiraterone, knowing that, I'm assuming that they knew that likelihood that it would respond would have been low? Well, let me, let me, let me back up just a bit. I started abiraterone basically, uh, when I actually saw a doctor, uh, in, in February, uh, who I no longer am, am, a, am a patient of, and I brought up the peace study, the peace one study with, with him and the fact that it had been shown. And that was actually before I got my somatic testing done on my DNA, but, uh, the peace one study had shown that it can be very beneficial uh, you know, following, you know, taxel, et cetera. So he uh, basically suggested I go ahead and start taking it. So it definitely would not, not uh, hurt anything. It did take me some time to find that particular drug because I'm on Medicare Part D and I wasn't uh, clairvoyant. So therefore I didn't know abiraterone may be one of the drugs I might need to take in the future. So therefore I ended up with a drug plan that doesn't cover abiraterone very well. And so it took me about a month uh, to find find it where it was at a price that I was willing to pay. And so that's why there was a lag between February and April. And then, of course, when I saw my uh, oncologist in uh, the new one that I, that I had in May, uh, they basically were okay with me continuing abiraterone. And in fact, I just saw them two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, and asked, should I continue the abiraterone? And uh, basically, she was told, she told me that I should, should go ahead and continue taking it, even though initially, indications are it is not doing much but her response was that she felt like it might be doing some good just not enough that we can actually measure that yeah so i mean i i kind of get that because you know there's this this is a definition of lack of precision and precision medicine um but i also think about the flip side of it is that there are you know uh consequences of taking abiraterone i'm on abiraterone and um so, you know, this is a case where why take a drug if it's not going to do anything? And I think RB1 is, is resistant to Abby. And so, you know, Brad, I'm, you know, hopefully, you know, everybody gets the point I'm making, which is, you know, I think that there's this proclivity to give drugs just so that um, the doctor is doing something, but knowing that it may in fact not do a whole lot, you know, this is a bit of a conundrum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian, this really good point that points that you're making there, um, really good. Uh, just one question uh, regarding the RB mutation is, <clears throat> is, is, does that also mean that the uh, enzalutamide and darolutamide will, will also not work? Most likely, that would be correct. I think that's that's true, Jonathan. Okay. And by the way, really good points about just the incentive to just offer something. If you were offering something, then you're doing your job. Well, yeah. and, and within the standard of care. And so the, it, yes. it's very defensible uh, to do something that's within the standard of care. 
the moment you start to get personalized, it starts to get more fringy and off label and potentially uh, liability issues might be uh, concerns. Yeah. All right. All right. But you're not sure about whether or not the uh, enzalutamide or apalutamide would also not work. I'm pretty right. sure. It, I'm pretty sure it, it's, it, it doesn't work, Jonathan. I know that Abby does not. And um, I, you know, there's similarity across all those drugs. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, but something, something that's something going to prevent. Yeah, the only one going to pretty much prevent all the AR drugs from working. Yeah, I see. All right, man. Okay. So sorry I interrupted you, Mike, but I think that sets the stage much better for the choices you're facing now. Yes, absolutely. Good point. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, if, sorry, I if I can just put a, a cross the T and dot the I on this one, because RB1 is a difficult target to treat, we should really be thinking about what are the available options to treat it. Obviously, you're taking Plavicto, and that probably should work, but to a certain extent. But um, I think that that's where you know we should really be focusing a lot of our efforts. Yeah, and, and I think that's part of the challenge with with any of those three three mutations that I've got. Of course, P10 isn't a mutation; it's just a flat loss. Uh, yeah. The issues are you really you really get into the signaling pathways, et cetera, and that's where it begins to get very murky. And of course, I'm not enough of a uh, cellular biologist to fully understand everything I've been studying. But uh, for example, uh, P10 really is effect, affects the, the P13K signaling pathway. And so far, a lot of the drug efforts towards uh, coming up with a solution that addresses that particular pathway has come up very, very short. And uh, what I have found is that it's better to start looking downstream, if you will, at some of the other pathways such as AKT and mTOR which is a lot of what uh, we're going to find in the recommendations here that I have uh, that we're trying to address those those pathways further downstream. Uh, just quickly interrupt. So, Rick, you you put something in the chat here for um, some articles about RB1 loss and, and therapies there. Can you speak to it, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about I didn't know about this prior to this conversation. I just started, you know, Googling. Um, RB1 loss, and this was the first article that came up, and uh, looks like something that you know I'll I'll try to read, and I am familiar with tumor signaling to a degree, um, so I'll I'll read it and see what I can come up. But it looks like uh, I don't know. That's a nice title, <laughs> so. Uh, I'll be looking into LSD one inhibition and see if there's any hope there or what the article has to say. I just thought I, I'd share. Yeah. And, and, and really, I mean, like, like I said, uh, RB one is one thing to look at and study on, but really you have to bring in the P 10 as well as the, uh, PP 53 into the conversation in the study, if you will. And there's sure. a lot of, uh, I'm gonna use the term for my limited expertise uh some some uh commonality in a lot of cases but it all gets back to the signaling pathways etc and, and what drugs are available that can begin to impact those and a lot of the drugs that we're going to look at today even uh really haven't been tested in prostate cancer they've been tested other cancers and shown some benefits for some of these pathways uh but but cancer really hasn't have, had testing done with these particular drugs and of course then we start mixing multiple drugs then you get back into the, the bigger issue of, of, you know, without any clinical trials, et cetera, no, no dosing specific information, et cetera. So it's really up to the oncologist or whatever to make those decisions and determine how to go forward, as well as be able to, to monitor you so that when we do get significant adverse events, which some of these drugs are pretty toxic, uh, how do we respond to those? So those are some of the, the challenges that we have. Uh, are you just MD just MD are you at MD Ander Anderson? Say what now, Rick? Are you, you said Houston, is that MD Anderson? No, no, we ended up uh, uh, splitting, splitting ways. I'm now at Houston Methodist in Houston. 
And just for my understanding, I recall, and, and maybe Brian can speak to this, the P10 and TP53, I think were variants that Bryce Olson had. And if I recall, P10 is one that's very common, but they don't have a lot of drugs for it. Correct. So P10 shows on about 50% of the advanced, of, very, uh, of the aggressive variant cancers. And uh, uh, you're right, there's not a lot of drugs that, that, that really work on that because that gets back to that P13K signaling pathway. And uh, here's something else, some other point I was going to make uh, that has escaped me. But oh, yeah, uh, with P10 loss, a lot of times, you see this cancer uh, migrate towards being neuroendocrine, which is even worse. And that's, I think, true for uh, RB1. Um, yes, Bryce has those two mutations as well, Brad. And remind me, how has that influenced his treatment? Um, it seems to me that it meant, in his case, that some things that he might have tried, he could have been predicted wouldn't work. Like, I think even when he tried a radionuclide, it, it, like Pluvicto, uh, it was predictable that he might not respond well, and he didn't. So that is, is do, you, do you recall how those two mutations influenced Bryce's uh, treatment choices? Um, I believe he was taking a PARP inhibitor for, for uh, P10, uh, but don't quote me on that. Um, you know, I, so I, I don't remember, you know, the correlation between all of his mutations and his, and his treatment. So I, I, I wouldn't want him to speak there. Okay, so but but I guess just to make an underline, uh, Mike, uh, having a conversation with Bryce uh, would be useful because he's really smart about all this stuff because he's been at it for so long and he's very articulate, um, and he also has a couple of the same uh, variants of significance. I, yeah, and, and just to, sorry, just to add one more point to that too, it would be interesting to know whether or not that is successful with patients who have RB1. Probably unlikely, but uh, it's just a, a question to, to, to ask. And one, one comment I'll make with respect to the Plavecto, of course, in my case, based upon my uh, PMSA PET scans, the my uptake was very, very high. I was in, in like the 30 to 40 range. And so that is way up there. A lot of times you'll find uptake being in, you know, 10 or less. So that that did indicate that we would have some success. Now, the question I've got and I have asked is, okay, so we're potentially going to be successful in knocking back some of this cancer that's expressing PSMA, which is a good thing, but how much cancer do I have also that does not express PSMA, which Plavicto is not going to impact? The other thing, an expectation in my mind, and let's just put it this way, when I ask the questions, I have not had any medical folks uh, argue back with me is my expectation is that I will finish Plavicto treatment in March and that by July, the cancer will be roaring back once again. And that's when the, the last standard of care options, bazitaxel with carboplatin. And so that's really the purpose of the conversation we're having today is to figure out what you do after Plavicto at that point. So like trying to help you figure out what's your next best treatment option. Correct. Knowing full well that, as, as Brian has, has experienced, I believe, uh, especially when you start talking about, you know, drugs that weren't, have not necessarily been clinically tested for prostate cancer, number one, uh, and, and the fact that uh, uh, you're mixing multiple drugs and finding medical folks that will, you know, uh, line up with you and assist you in, in trying some of these new things, if you will, is it, going to be a challenge. Okay, so um, just on that score, uh, Rick and I had a conversation just this week with Don Lamont, who is a integrative oncologist, a, a medical oncologist, um, who is working closely with Bob Gatenby, um, whom we love, uh, and has the uh, the heterogeneity, adaptive therapy, you know, evolutionary biology approach, and so she may be someone who could advise you. And and Rick is uh, proceeding on. Uh, becoming a patient of hers and i've encouraged brian to have a conversation with her as well so that might be a way for you to get to a treating physician who's willing to um, prescribe uh, more off-label types of of, of uh, treatments okay uh, i could mention 
Um, so I'm in the process of onboarding with her. Uh, here's uh, um, yeah. Do you want to uh, respond to James uh, or? I'll put it in the chat, sure. Sure. Um, so she doesn't take uh, insurance. She uh, charges $10 a minute for her time. So she's $600 an hour, um, which is expensive, but uh, I'm willing to step up for, uh, you know, an hour or two. And I think probably well spent. Uh, she's integrative. <clears throat> so she uh, is an expert. I, I her, her credentials are super. And uh, we talked for half an hour. Uh, she seems great. So I look at, I'm very similar to you, um, Mike, because uh, I'm starting, I'm doing a PSMA scan Friday and I'm starting Pluvicto the 13th and I'm on Abiraterone as a bridge right now. And this is to be something that Jonathan would say, uh, you know, I'm taking something that probably is not going to help. Uh, but I'm hoping I'm one of the 10% or uh, 5%. Um, anyway, enough about me, but I understand. But what you're saying, Mike, uh, is re resonating with me and probably all of us here. Um, but to conclude, um, Dr. Lamont, to me, offers a complementary perspective and something that I can do through diet, exercise, and uh, maybe some other, I won't say alternative drugs, but drugs that would be complementary to what I would get from a comprehensive cancer center running down the NCCN guidelines. So I'm, I'm going to sign up and, uh, you know, it's it's kind of like, let's do everything we can do. Um, I think we all understand that just taking a few drugs is not alone is not going to do. It's not going to save us. Um, and by doing um, everything we can, we might extend our lives. I agree. OK, Mike. Uh I, I'm sorry that we've uh, diverted from that. was uh, probably a good diversion. Yeah, it was a good diversion. Good diversion. Yeah. These are all good diversions, I think, setting the stage. Maybe you should walk us through your uh, spreadsheet here and talk about some of the options you've seen and, and sort of like what your, your, what your priorities are, or your favorites are, what your short list is. First of all, how many do you have in total? Uh, I think it's, uh, let's see here. If I can get this to work. Here, I got a number. It's up. I got to look again. Uh, looks like I got about seventeen, much like Brian. Okay, so seventeen, and most of those came from looks like CureMatch uh, okay. Foundation Medicine. So from CureMatch Foundation Medicine, Massive Bio, I presume those were the and cancer comments. Correct. Those are the are the primary ones, and I found a couple towards the bottom, which just happened to catch my eye based on research and study that I had, which is I pat I pat. A patzerib, which is also in some clinical trials right now. But uh, if you'll, as, as we go down through here, you'll see the ones that I ranked, there's many not ranked at all, but the ones that I ranked uh, include that uh, patzerib as well as the cure match options. The massive bio, the foundation of medicine, I didn't even, didn't even bother to try to split hairs and rank those. And uh, are these in rank order? Are they any kind of, any kind of order? Uh, basically, it's just, I, the, the, as far as the flow through the spreadsheet, you got by the, the recommending agency, i.e. I started with Foundations Medicine, but then I've, I've got them ranked and got them in order further down based upon the ones that I, I specifically did rank. Okay, go. All right. Well, once again, getting back, and actually we can take the first one, Everolimus, I guess it is, as well as the second one, which is test, test limus. Uh Both those are foundation based upon uh, my DNA analysis, if you will. But once again, 
what's been found with these particular two drugs by themselves of the monos therapy, they've uh, not, not provided a lot of a response. And uh, so therefore, uh, I have not ranked these two. Uh, as we get on down here in a moment, we'll, we'll, you'll see uh, Pure Match also has those drugs recommended, but in conjunction with some other drugs. So I think, you know, once again, their perspective is that by themselves, they may not work well, but when you, when you combine them with some other drugs, you might have a, a better response. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So my number, I think I skipped number three. Yeah, number three, of course, is just, as I've already stated to you, cabazitaxel with carboplatin, which Foundation Medicine also uh, was one of their recommendations, but that's basically a standard of care option. And uh, at this point in time, the expectation and the knowledge that I've got is that that would work very much like docetaxel, even though I will admit with aggressive variant, uh, the carboplatin, the platinum uh, element of that has shown to be somewhat uh, responsive, if you will, with respect to knocking the cancer back. But once again, uh, the, the durability of it's going to be very short, probably three or four months in my case is all it's going to do. So it's a matter of, you know, are you even interested in doing another chemotherapy? Uh, I'm a little vain maybe, but lose my hair again. Uh, and, and, and for no more than, you know, a few months. So that's why it's not ranked at all. It's, it's something, that, uh, in the standard of care world, it's my only option going forward, but hopefully I can do something different between now and then. The next one is, uh, com comes from Massive Bio, and that was a, a bipolar antigen therapy in conjunction uh, with another radionucleide, which is uh, uh, radium-223. Now, radium-223 really does nothing towards the primary uh, cancer in the prostate, which, as you've already mentioned, Brad, I still have mine. I've never had a biopsy of it. Uh, my current uh, lead oncologist does not want to do a biopsy due to, as she puts it, risk. Uh, so all my biopsies to date and the DNA that Foundation's done did uh, came from my bone biopsy that was done in the hospital when I was diagnosed a little over a year ago. Uh, but bio, bipolar angiogen therapy, this particular uh, clinical trial recommendation of Massive Bio, it interests me. However, saying that, Based on my studies and what my limited understanding can, can bring together, I'm not sure uh, how successful it might be. And I think there's a lot of risk with it being, as, as some put it, uh, throwing gasoline on a fire. And especially with this aggressive variant that I've got. So even though it, it interests me very much, I'd love to try it. Uh, getting shot up with, with, a, with a high dose of testosterone and having the cancer take off uh, very, very quickly and grow very, very quickly and, and not being able to get the testosterone out of your system quick enough could, could end up with some results that I'm not interested in seeing. Mike, do you know I, if you have AR copy number gain? Not that I know of. Okay. I think you should probably um, try, to, try to get a handle on that because as far as I know, those are the two indicators for positive responses, P53 and AR copy number gain. And how do you do that, Brian? Because I'm you're you're giving me inf information. I don't have a clue on how to find out. Uh, so it would come from a sequencing report. Um, so we should probably go back to Foundation to see if they have that information or if it actually is, is in your report. I can't remember if it is, Mike. Um, it, it, it it's it, AR. You know, the copy number again. AR is not in my report. I know that. Okay. So, yeah, but this this is uh, something that. Uh, is not always included in the report. So, you know, uh, from over uh, expression um, from RNA seq data uh, to copy number gain, not always included, especially from foundation, which is a very streamlined glimpse of uh, sequencing. They're known to be very streamlined in their reporting, uh, meaning. It would be easy that you have AR copy number gain, but they just didn't report it. It would be easy that you had other uh, significant um, variants uh, that just are not reported. So you may have to dig a little deeper. Um, I think you should have RNA-seq um, because the copy number gain uh, 
is the precursor for overexpression of AR. So that's all that copy number gain can, um, you know, you can infer that, well, if you have a bunch of uh, AR copy number gains, then you're probably making, you know, more a AR. But you could also get that from RNA-seq, which would be a more direct uh, view, uh, one step more towards the actual, hey, am I making a, a lot more AR? And I am so, trying to, I am working on it. It's going slowly, I will admit, but trying to get the, the Tempest X80 right now. Okay. I don't know why you wouldn't um, get a, uh, um, a biopsy of your primary tumor. I have no idea if why that's risky. Yeah, I, I was going to chime in on that. We are such gluttons for anything that gives you more data to guide your treatment. The notion that you wouldn't take advantage of a biopsy, which you know Brian just went through and, and essentially demanded uh, needle biopsies, and he's also leaning in to get surgery, which is going to harvest a bunch of more tissue that he can do various tests on. So, the maybe your clinician is uh, um, conservative because they they don't value the insights you can get from. Uh, uh, analyzing uh, tissue biopsy, but right. Uh, yeah, right now, right now, in all honesty, I think we also have to take into account. I'm not once again, I'm not a medical expert here, but uh, hopefully, the plavicto is significantly radiating prostate, and so I'm not sure what will be left when we're done. Mm. Oh, uh, okay. Mike, I'm going to make an introduction to. Um, do, do you have a contact at Foundation? Because uh, if you don't, I, I know somebody who does like patient navigation work, and um, I can. Yeah, make I, I do not have. I do not have. A, okay, I got that. I so I'll, yeah, I'll send. I'll send an email uh, to uh, uh, David Marshak is our our normal guy that helps us, but he he's on um, attorney leave, I believe. So um, I've got a a backup that I will send it out to after this call. Okay. All right. Well, we'll continue through this. Here and we'll get down to where I rank some things. Of course, the next two, Massive Bio did provide to me, and uh, I just kept them on this list, even when we did do a, a kind of a review of what they offered, and, and I'd clarified a few things. Uh, I am not eligible for these two clinical trials per the criteria they provided, uh, so therefore, they're not ranked either. So now, uh, we're down to number seven, which, of course, is Pure Match, and that's where I've started to rank things. And the first one that I have ranked here uh, ended up with a Pure Match uh, number, if you will, of 67%, which, uh, in, in speaking with Ali, that's quite high because you said in most cases, on average, the, the match is in like the 33% range. So I'm like double the, the, the normal average that they see. So this, you know, theoretically from their, their research and their, uh, biology looks like it might have some strong possibilities of, of having some impact, if you will. Uh, once again, uh, we can get back to looking at, at, at targeted molecular alterations. What they provided to me here, of course, is the AK2 pathway via mTOR, uh, which, of course, is the Everlimus once again, but then also combining it with uh, a PDL1 uh, with pembrolizumab, and then, of course, hitting the R R SRC uh, mutation uh, and TP53 via the ponitinib, if you will. Uh, so this looks very interesting to me, but once again, based on my research as a non-medical person who is oftentimes struggling, there, there, if this would take an oncologist, it's really going to work very closely with you because you start mixing these and they all have some pretty significant toxicities. And so it's going to be a matter of probably some, some slow experimentation to see what, what levels of, of uh, dosages you can, can use and what mix of those dosages can be applied. Just if I, could, if I could interrupt on that quick, Mike, because this has been a recurring theme with the co drug combinations from CureMatch. At a uh, target cancer meeting I was at last week, Roselle Kurtzrock, who's the founder of, of CureMatch, um, recommended a doctor at UCSD who's a specialist in dosing. We've been looking for this. So if you're taking three drugs, do you take one third the no normal dose or do you titrate? How do you do it? This, this doctor has thought that through. 
So um, if you proceed down a combination path, we have an expert now who can help you with that dosing strategy. What's the doctor? Okay, that's good. That's good now. What What's the doctor's name? I'll have to look it up. Could you make your Excel slightly larger? It's hard to read. Okay, let me see if we can do it without slightly. Yeah, slightly. I think that that'll get us pretty much to where we need to be. Thank you. There we go. Hopefully. Uh, of course, the um, next Mike, do, you, do you have the uh, PDL1 or DMMR mutations that uh, favor using Pembro? I, I did have uh, on the on the foundation's report, I did have PDL1 and uh, it showed, I forget what the numbers were on that, but uh, Ali saw that as she was putting this, this report together. And that's why they included uh, the, the Pembro in, in, in this um, set of options. Just to mention, uh, I keep, this folks' noggins don't seem to get that PDL1 uh, expression is not on a report is not uh, typically a mutation. It's a overexpression or a high or a, a expression. Uh, it's not a mutation. Um, so I, I just keep trying to chirp in on this. Um, so if if foundation flagged PDL1 uh, in any way, one would have to expect that uh, they looked at RNA seq, so they were quantifying the RNA um, expression and noted that PDL1 was uh, on the higher side relative to other patients, which would indicate uh, that the target for Pembro is in your tumor, and that's very encouraging because most of us prostate cancer patients don't have that. And and I will admit, and once again, my, my understanding in order to even talk intelligently is limited, but I know on their report, uh, they didn't mention, did mention with, with respect to PDL one was via IHC. Oh, they did an IHC. Okay, great. That's awesome. Okay. Well, at least I said, at least, at least I remembered something of the value. You, know, you <laughs> are uh, really revealing that you've been doing your homework. Been when trying, I, but a lot, a lot of us way over my head. When I first talked to you, um, I see a huge um, depth of knowledge increase. You know, to be commended. Well, I appreciate that, Rick. Thank you very much. I have, I have learned a lot. I'm still far from from what I need to learn. So all of us. <laughs> okay, let me. Uh, let me... Uh, sorry to interrupt, but Rick, because. What you just said, does that apply to this MSI high uh, feature also? Uh, no, no, MSI high is microsatellite instability. Right. And that will be revealed by sequencing, not uh, expression. Okay, okay, that's all right. So that is a mutation? Um, or just a genetic feature or? It, yeah, I would have to say more of a genetic. I have to look that up. Uh, I think it's. Um, I think it's considered a rearrangement. I No, I well, I'll, I'll look it up. I'm not an expert because I've never really come across MSI high patients, you know, in all my work at Human Longevity. When I just, and so, but I believe it's. Um, it's a nucleotide repeating pattern that uh, tends to uh, allow the immune system to uh, recognize better. And so that's why it's uh, included in uh, the criteria for Pembro. But I, I, I need to look that up. But it's not an expression. It it is from uh, the genome. Okay, my my number two my here. I'll I'll do some homework. Sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, my number two, of course, is uh, basically the same thing from from Pure Match. Once once again, with a 
a 65% uh, matching score, if you will. So once again, very high. In this case, pretty much the same two drugs, Everolimus and Pembro, but this time uh, substituted, substituting the paninitib with bosonitinib, if you will. And uh, it's just a slightly different uh, option we've got. The plenitib uh, does have some pretty toxic, op toxic uh, elements with it. And so I think uh, based on what I understand in researching this, so plenitib uh, is not quite as toxic. So maybe another option here to reduce slightly the toxic concerns that we have, but still have basically the same three drugs or same three types of drugs. That, that are impacting many of the same uh, signaling pathways, et cetera, that uh, are, are impacted by my mutations. And of course, the next one here, uh, once again, also a pure match. Once again, you'll see the same thing, you know, Everlemus, Pembro, and then Nib, if you will. And of course, it's uh, also, once again, SRC TP53. And so it's just another option that we've got, once again, with a pretty high score of 63%. So 63, 65, 67 with the top three pure match options for three drug combos. And uh, that's where I pretty much rank them uh, as one, two, and three. And then of course we get into pure matches, uh, two drug combos. And of course still 59%. And of course, as you can see, the next one is 58%. Uh, and so here in this case, we're, we're pretty much sticking with, uh, in, in the number four option, if you will, Everlemus and Pembro with Everlemus, you know, really focus on the AK2 pathway with mTOR. And then of course, uh, the PD1, uh, option also. And then of course, uh, number five there is, is, uh, you've still got the Pembro, but this time instead of Everlemus, you're looking at the Poninitib, if you will. Uh, which is which is impacting or affecting one of the different pathways, if you will, than than the Everlimus did. And so basically, I've got these 10, 11, and of course their next two drug option. I've got listed as as uh, my number six option. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and of course, like I said, that's a two drug option. Where we're here in the, in the sixth one, we we're substituting once again the bosutinib uh, for the Everlimus, if you will, but still retaining the Pembro. And then quickly that we get into cure matches, one drug options, uh, which uh, I didn't even rank because once again, I, I, I feel confident that uh, with my particular cancer, the one, one drug options are going to do very little. I think it's really going to take a multi-drug option and really my preference is a three drug, drug options, of course. Then we get into the last two that I've got here, which is some that I found online using a, a patzerib, if you will. The first one is a patzerib plus abiraterone. We've already kind of talked about the fact that abiraterone doesn't seem to be doing much for me at all, uh, but the patzerib is currently in uh, some clinical trials. And if you'll notice over here, uh, some preliminary information they've got is particularly in, in patients with P10 lost tumors, uh, they're, they're finding that uh, survival, progression-free survival, is 19.1 months versus 14.2 months with just abiraterone alone. And uh, so, uh, and also, once again, it, it's, it's uh, focused or targeting, if you will, on that AKT, in this case, the AKT1 pathway. And then, of course, the last one here is, once again, a patzerib with, with another clinical trial, excuse me, uh, is of interest also. But this time, instead of abiraterone, they're, they're, they're substituting a, a tezolizumab uh with with uh in the combination with apatzerib so uh like i said these are two trials that i don't know that much about don't know much about exactly how they're going to impact my particular molecular alterations other than the fact that akt pathway from my research is one of the things they're trying to look at here so that's pretty much what i can tell you with respect to these uh options Mike, I noticed that you didn't include any options from cancer comments, and I know Emma Stibelman has been very, very helpful. Have you not had a chance to interact with her yet? No, they basically, uh, Emma told me that uh, she knew I was getting ready to take Clavicto. She felt like it was a very good course of action, and uh, she was really going to wait until we saw how that went, how that treatment process goes, 
And then uh, she felt like at that point in time, she would uh, look at some other options to go forward with. So basically at this point, I've, I've got no input from them based on the fact that that uh, they feel like Povecto is, is a good option for me right now. So what you, did you mention you're going to get another round of scans coming up soon to, as you sort of sort of get to the end of the flu victo treatment and then that would that, and then you could go to her with that information as input. Yeah, it's basically going to be after we finish one third. I mean, finish, finished uh, courses one and two of six. We're going to do the scans before I do my third one. We most likely will do another set of scans after my fourth one. And then, of course, another set of scans at the sixth one. So we'll be doing scans after one and two scans after three and four. And then of course, uh, at the end, five and six. However, uh, if we see we're not having much success, which we don't expect, uh, there may be some discussion as to whether we continue or not. Cause I know that some people have taken Blavicto, had very little response and they've actually stopped. Yeah, um, and what about uh, in the chat, Rick threw out the idea that you should get a liquid biopsy. Are you, in, are you, is that also underway? Or are you considering that? I had one. Once again, it was Foundations Medicine. Uh, basically, it came back with, uh, I think it was two additional mutations that weren't, didn't seem to be super significant. And so I, I, that was part of what was, was provided to all these providers, i.e. Massive Bio, as well as Cure Match when they made these these recommendations. So they had all that information. So I, I would just recommend that because liquid biopsies are relatively painless, you're getting blood draws anyway. Um, you could, and, and given the possibility that your cancer may be moving uh, in response to the treatment you're giving it, uh, it would be useful to uh, repeat liquid biopsies, almost like when you do, you're doing your scans every couple months, it would seem to me. Uh, just to see yeah, if people are changing. Yeah, my my intent. I had the had the liquid biopsy done. I believe it was around July of this year. And of course, uh, my intent. I have not had specific discussion on that point. But my intent was to to have a liquid biopsy done about every six months. Cool. Okay, we just have a few more minutes. Uh, any questions? Uh, raise your hand. Uh, 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 comment in the chat, jump in. Uh, we just have a few more minutes. Anybody? I'm raising my hand. <laughs> go ahead, Jonathan, go. Um, uh, Mike, uh, uh, just a few questions about other things. Did, did you, I, I may have missed this, but did you consider SBRT to spot uh, tumors? You know, uh, I don't I don't. I really don't have spots. I've pretty much got complete coverage. <laughs> okay. My spine uh, is is it was in very bad shape. My my pelvic region was pretty much covered. My uh, right femur was pretty much covered, and now my left clavicle as well as my right shoulder uh, are have significant uh, tumors, if you will. So it's not a matter of spots. It's a matter of pretty much my entire skeleton. I've got got uh, got uh, metastasis on my ribs. Uh, the only place I don't have metastasis is in my, you know, my forearms, my hands, and my head that I know of. Okay, I'm very sorry about that. Um, when when when, when your when your initial radio, uh, you know, radiology on, oncologist pulls up the scan, this this happened back, you know, right after I got out of the hospital. After I got yeah, after I got out of the hospital last year. And uh, interesting thing is she, she brought it up on, on, the, on the screen and the first thing out of her mouth, well, that's not normal. So you know you're in trouble at that point. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, maybe it's still something to consider after the Pluvicto treatment. Like, let's hope. Let's hope that the Pluvicto gets almost everything. And then maybe there are a yeah, couple. Yeah. Okay. A couple not. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. At that point, I think there may be, if we if we if we're if we're significant in knocking back the cancer enough, then there may may be some significant opportunities to uh, do some spot, spot work. In fact, my local oncologist, who's actually the one giving me the Pulvicto, has mentioned that. For example, uh, I have had a little back pain. I think it's more muscular, but that's one of the things we're going to look at October twentieth. And if indeed it's cancer related. We may end up doing some some spot radiation just to give me some relief in, in my back. But like I said, right now I think it's muscular more than cancer oriented. Okay. 
OK, well, then I've got two other things to ask you about. One is, um, uh, again, after your Pluvicto and all that, um, maybe consider Provenge if it's worked well. Yeah, I've, I've, I've actually asked about Provenge. Now, once again, uh, I'm, I'm going to end up probably you know, playing one oncologist against another. My, my quarterback, my lead oncologist down in Houston, definitely not interested in even looking at Provenge. Does not feel like that's of any value. However, local oncologist giving the Levicto uh, didn't didn't give me, I'll say, a, 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 you know, positive reviews, but also was was not dismissive, and uh, so that's something that I I will continue to keep in the back pocket as as something to look at. Okay, let me just chime in there real quick, um, uh, Jonathan. I'm glad that you brought that up. I was going to bring that up as well, Mike. I just had a conversation with Raina McKay. And after my surgery that I'll have, you know, next month or in November, um, she suggested that we look at doing Provenge. You don't typically get a PSA response, but sometimes it can be helpful in keeping the tumors at bay. So um, that's just another oncology voice, you know, in the mix. Every patient's different, but I wanted to share that. No, and I appreciate that very much. And, and, and I'm in agreement with you. I understand. It doesn't do much for PSA. Of course, in my case, I don't put out much PSA, so it's kind of immature, but uh, it does show some, some longevity benefits. Okay, and one other thing I want to put out that I sent an email out about is uh, Sabi Zabulin, which is also known as Veru 111. Um, it's a sort of an oral, uh, well, it's an anti-tubulin. Uh, chemo drugs are anti-tubulins. Okay, and I won't go into detail unless you want me to, but anyway, it's sort of like an oral chemo, but with very few side effects or very mild side effects relatively. And uh, um, so it's uh, now it's in phase three clinical trials for prostate cancer, but um, it's also been found to be effective against COVID. So of course they rushed that through, they could do those on a shorter time scale. And in a, in a week or so, it's going to go to the FDA for uh, consideration for approval for COVID, at least for emergency use authorization. So I asked one of my oncologists about whether or not he might be able to get that on uh, off label. You know, if it is approved in that way, could he get it off label for uh, prostate cancer? And he said, maybe we will see. <laughs> Uh, to quote them exactly. So I'm just tossing that out as a possibility of something else you might be able to use, especially if you're considering cabazitaxel, you know, which will have side effects. Um, you, you'll get a sort of a similar impact with, hopefully, with Sabi Zabia, uh, but without the side effects or with much less side effects. Including, yeah, I saw, you, including, I saw your notes on that. So I've, okay. I've kept that. Okay. It's also called Veru, V-E-R-U-111. A little easier to remember. All right. Well, anyway, those, I just wanted to throw those things out. Good luck. So you've already had your first um, a Pluvicto treatment? First two. First two. First two already. And how are you doing? I mean, how, doing especially good. like uh, dry good. mouth and all that. Uh, very, very, very minimal, hardly notice it at all. Uh, in fact, uh, on another call on, there's been quite a few folks that have done, done Plavicto and uh, the worst uh, person that has responded said that they had dry mouth in the morning and after they finished the Plavicto, it lasted for about three months and they were back to pretty much normal. So at this point, in time, I'm having really, I'm not having dry mouth to speak of. And uh, as far as the pain, uh, Elimination, it's, it's worked wonderfully. So, uh, like I said, we're hoping that when we do the scans, that we'll find that it has been very successful in knocking back a lot of the cancer. Yeah. Okay. Well, good luck. Thank you. So, I think we've just about run out of time. Uh, this has been a great uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, Mike, for sharing your situation and your okay. considerations. I thought it was a pretty rich conversation um, around. Yeah some of the considerations around it. And when we send out the notes, you know, uh, we'll, we'll solicit 
uh, feedback from those who weren't able to join us today.